I'm Shujata Ghosh, and I would like to welcome you all in the post-lunch session of the first day of the talk 2013. And in this session, we would have three talks, uh, contributed talks, and the first talk will be on Ceteris Paribas structures in logics of game forms. The authors are Davide Grossi, Emiliano Lorini, and Francois Schwarzenstrober, and Francois will give the talk. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, normally, it was uh, Emiliano Rolini who should have uh, given this talk, but uh, unfortunately, he was not able to get the visa for India. So he's really sorry not to be here. Um, okay. Um, so I will start with a, a little motivation. Um, um, so this starts with uh, this observation, which is that um, strategies in a game are of ceteris paribus nature. So that is to say, if I say to you, um, Anne and Bob perform a winning strategy, that is exactly the same as saying that they win, but all their current choices are uh, equal, and these choices of the other are uh, arbitrary. Okay? So this fact... Um, is going to be central and um, we'll be able to in, it will be, with this we will be able to encode uh, logic of agency into Ceteris Paribus uh, logics. So here uh, in this talk we are going to um, compare Ceteris Paribus logic and some uh, uh, logics of games forms so such like uh, STIT and coalition logic of propositional control. So, and we have some, um, we can uh, infer from this some complexity results. So, we start by presenting uh, our Ceteris Paribus logic. Then I will uh, talk about Stit and Ceteris Paribus. And then I will uh, talk about coalition logic of propositional control. And then I will conclude. So, um, the language we have here is a propositional log language here, added with a model operator like this, okay, where x is a finite set of propositions. And this is read that phi is possible, but all things that are expressed in x are being equal. So this means that if you evaluate this formula, it means that there exists a world such that um, it has the same valuations for all propositions that are in x, uh, are the same that in world W and it satisfies phi. So for instance, in, in this model here, uh, if, we are, if you are in this world here, um, it's possible, so it, there exists a world that has the same valuation for sun and for rain, that is to say this world, in which we have a rainbow. So, um, there is an axiomatization for this, for this logic. So, we start with the uh, tautologies of propositional calculus, and then we add uh, here actions for logic S5 for the model operator empty set. And, in fact, we can reduce, that is, we can transform all this operator by using only the operator with the empty set here. How we do that? We simply here quantify over all the valuation, all possible valuation of a proposition belonging to X. And if this, if this valuation is satisfied in the current world, then it implies that in all, you are browsing all the world of the model. And if such a world is satisfying this same valuation, then it implies that this world should satisfy phi. We assume x to be finite, yes. And uh, we have more disponents and necessitation for, um, in this logic. So now we will address the problem of satisfiability. That is to say we have a formula phi and we want to know whether there exists a model for it. So um, this problem is next time. Uh, why? Because we can use the previous uh, reduction axioms okay, to transform the initial formula into a formula of S5, but this translation 
because we quantify over all the valuations, will blow up the size of the formula such that the formula will be exponential sized. Okay? But then this formula, which is in exponential size to, 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 the, to the previous formula, we will apply an NP procedure, and this will, uh, we will so have a procedure which, which is next time. So um, we will prove uh, next time harness by reduction to, to uh, a variant of STIT here. So first I will uh, recall the definition of STIT. C, uh, C to its uh, logic. Then I will explain you the embedding and show the next, the next time hardness. And finally, I will uh, speak about a P-space fragment. So um, the logic state is as follows. So we have a propositional part and we have a state operator here meaning that the group, so J is a group of agents, and this means that the group J ensures the property phi. Okay? Um, so models look like this. There are games, except that here you have non-determinism here. You can, okay, you can add a, an agent which is a nature, but here, uh, okay, in the, in the model we consider here, you have non-determinism here. So, uh, for instance here, um, in W, as we have P, P, P here, agent one sees to it that P is true. So models uh, are like this. Huh? You have a set of worlds. For each coalition, you have a relation. This, these relations are all included into the relation of empty set. You have that the relation for agents, for a group of agents is the intersection of the individuals that appears in the, in the coalition. And we have here the property of independence of agents here. I will explain it on the, uh, recall you on the other slide, and evaluation. So the property of independence of agents here, um, I will explain you by uh, giving a counterexample. So if we do not have it, for instance, we have models like this. Uh, if uh, an agent chose, the, the, the agent red chose this action and agent uh, gray chose this action, we have no outcome. So this means that if we choose actions for every agent here, so points, for instance, uh, double, uh, for instance, T and U, here it should be a, an outcome, and here we have no outcome. But in the previous model, it's okay. Um, so now, we want to have a lower bond, so we are going to embed STIT, because one variant of STIT is next time complete. So what we are going to do is to embed STIT into Ceteris Paribus, okay? So we have here a, a model of STIT, and uh, I will explain a translation, which is uh, the, the, the reduction. So. Uh, what are we going here? So um, let us remark that um, so playing a game here is uh, that we, we keep this strategy. So what we are going to do is to have uh, propositions here to capture, uh, to, to denote the actions. Okay? So for instance here, we have three actions for the player red here. So we need two propositions here. So these actions here, or here, it's the same, will be denoted by rep11 equals to zero, so false, and this proposition is false. Here, true zero and zero, zero, one, etc. And the translation will be as follows. This operator, so one sees to it phi, will be denoted by, okay, um, uh, sorry, here it's a translation of one sees to it phi. Yeah? Here will be denoted by, okay, um, this proposition being equal, we have the translation of phi. That is to say, in all those worlds, for instance, if I'm looking here, here I have one C to it phi, and here I will browse all the worlds here. I will browse the world which are in a red thing, and we do the same for the other 
like this. But if we only do this, there is a little problem. Um, so if we have, oh yes, so uh, if we have a group like this, we are going to translate. So we, we, this means it's, it's a set for denoting actions of agents J, okay? So if we are looking to a group, we simply take the union of those propositions, okay? Uh, like this. But here we have a problem because we do not have independence of agents. Okay? So in order to enforce uh, the independence of agents, we need to enforce, in fact, all the possible valuations on, on those propositions that denotes actions. Okay? And to do that, we simply add uh, this formula here. So to convince you that we have all the propositions in the model, so uh, let's, for instance, consider this proposition, so uh, the first proposition at 1, and then the second one at 0, 0, 0. Um, there exists a world in which we have this proposition, because here, in all world, and for all propositions, so for instance, the proposition, uh, the third proposition, we have uh, that this proposition is false, but remaining all the proposition except this one, this can be changed to true. So we can pass here, and we can also pass here. And in fact, we, can, we have all the proposition into the model. So if we have, um, if we have a state formula phi, which is um, satisfiable, okay, in a state model, um, so the first point is, uh, it's the same to say that, uh, so it's satisfiable in a model where we have at, le at most two power m actions. It's the same to saying that it has exactly two power m actions. So here we only restrict to state when you have, the where the number of actions is bounded, okay? And uh, it's the same to having this. So this to enforcing independence of agents and this to enforce, so the, the translation of the, of the formula. So to be convinced of the first part, it's just uh, if you have this, for instance, you, you can duplicate uh, worlds like this, uh, and it doesn't change the, 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 value, the, the, the truth conditions of the formula. Um, so here, we're going to consider uh, a fragment of state uh, called individual uh, state. Individual state is the language where we have only one agent sees to it that, and not a group. Just so we can prove that uh, our Ceteris Paribus logic, uh, the satisfiability problem of it, is also next time, is, or is next time hard by a reduction. We reduce the satisfiability individual state problem uh, such a reality problem to the Ceteris Paribus uh, problem. Uh, now we are, going to, we are going to consider a small fragment. So it's the fragment here. You have an example of, a, a, of such a formula. It's the fragment where <coughs> the sets here uh, that appears in a formula are uh, linearly ordered with the inclusion. The corresponding fragment in state is the fragment where the coalitions are uh, ordered, like this. This fragment has been proved to be p-space complete. So here, um, we can uh, we can give a procedure that runs in P space for this fragment of Ceteris Paribus. And how to do that? We can reduce, so this is a, a reduction in the other sense, okay? So we, we, we reduce uh, the linear order Ceteris Paribus to, 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 the, to the linear order state satisfiability problem here. And thus we have a P space proce procedure for, uh, for this. So how 
this reduction work? Um, it's quite simple. Uh, we simply say that the, the propositions um, are agents. <coughs> so the translation is simply this. Like this. Um, but then we have to encode the ceteris paribus uh, um, behavior into STIT. So this is done with this translation where we say that if P is true, uh, in, uh, so you, you, you are browsing all the proposition that appears in a X, and if P is true, it's equivalent to say that this coalition will enforce P. Otherwise, it will not be always the case in a, in a state formula. So you, you enforce it by this, and thus we have that this is equivalent to this. So here, the independence of agents is not necessary when you have the fragment uh, where the coalitions are linearly ordered. It's the same to saying that a formula is satisfiable. Uh, it, it's, it's not important. Okay. So the last part will be about coalition logic of propositional control. Uh, so this logic is uh, propositional here, and you have an operator here, indexed still by a, a group of agents. And uh, so this, this operator is read uh, as group J can change the valuation um, she is actually controlling, uh, such that phi uh, is true. So each agent here, for instance, agent 1, controls P and Q, and uh, agent 2 control R. And uh, so this means, in this example, for instance, diamond 1 phi, means that agent 1 can change the valuation of P and Q such that the formula phi becomes true. Um, so we can embed this logic into um, the state logic. Um, but in the same way, we have to, to encode the um, behavior um, of propositional control here into, into state. So the first one here, we have to say that when, if one agent controls uh, P, then there is no other agent which is controlling P. Here, uh, so here is the same part, but uh, if, if one agent controls P, no other agent controls uh, non-P. And here, it means that uh, for all proposition, there exists one agent that controls this proposition. So if you are in a world, either these agents put P at uh, true or P at false. And here, we enforce that all valuations are into the, into, into the model. And then, uh, this is read as, so J can change its own valuation. So it means in a, in a st uh, it lacks a translation of phi here. Um, so this means that the others agents uh, allows J uh, to, to, uh, to ensure phi. And uh, so if M is the number of prop uh, atomic proposition in the formula, um, phi is uh, satisfiable. So it's a propositional control formula and is satisfiable if only if um, the previous uh, conjunction and uh, this, the translation of this formula with this uh, is satisfiable in a state model where agent has at most two power m actions. And thus we, we can also, um, of course, we can also embed this because here we have at least two power m actions. We can also uh, embed this into Ceteris Paribus logic. So uh, in this talk, so we have defined, uh, redefined, because it was already defined by von Bentham and so on. Uh, we have redefined the Ceteris Paribus logic. Uh, we have given an, a comparison between several logics. 
and we have some uh, complexity results. And um, so um, maybe uh, this um, work may um, create kind of a common solver because the reasoning in all, all those different logic are similar. Maybe not the last one because uh, in fact the last one is a uh, complexity much lower. But for Steet and for Ceteris Paribus, Paribus, if you want to, to create a solver, maybe we can create the same solver for both. Uh, and also uh, continue to, to study different uh, logics and compare them uh, together and uh, that's all so thank you for your attention uh, this is not considered in this work not at all but maybe we can extend it uh, I don't know so maybe I will ask Emiliano because Emiliano is more familiar with the Ceteris Paribus uh, logic and so on so I replace him <laughs> Sorry. It's very nice to see different frameworks related. Okay, thanks. Um, can encode that. Uh, so, uh, in this form, you cannot encode Nash equilibrium and so on. Huh? You can on only say that uh, one agent performs something or can perform something, and that's more or less all. Oh, no, you can also say, for instance, uh, like. Um, uh, uh, do, you, do you know uh, ATL with a context? So it's more or less, you, you can also have a context here. Because you can say, um, on, not only uh, I can do something, but also, uh, okay, keeping the strategies of agents 1 and agents 2 uh, be the same, uh, agents 3 can do something. You can express this also. You say um, diamond 1, 2. So uh, 1 and 2 allows the fact that 1, 2, 3, see to it that phi is true. So you can express this also. Thank you. Our next talk is... Diffusible modalities, and the authors are Arena Brits and Ivan Vazinchak, and the talk will be given by Ivan. Okay, um, thank you very much. So, this is a joint work with my colleague Arena Brits, also from the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research in South Africa. So, let me start with a simple example here. Assume that we have a nuclear power plant, right? And in this nuclear power plant, we have an atomic pile and a cooling system. Each of them can be either on or off. And then we assume that we have an agent who is in charge of controlling, looking at what's going on with the pile and the, the cooler so that they, we can prevent uh, hazardous situations, situations in which the pile is on and the cooler is off. Now, from a knowledge representation perspective, we want to uh, formalize knowledge about this specific scenario. In particular, we want to be able to represent knowledge when there is some element of uncertainty, like the, the following examples here. So we may want to say that if the pile is on, then usually it's not a hazardous situation, right? But in the more specific context, namely when the pile is on and the cooling is off, it usually is a hazardous situation. So these two examples here illustrate an example of defeasible reasoning. Right? So, in the absence of information, we derive some conclusions, but when we get to a more specific context, we should be able to withdraw the previous conclusions. And the two examples at the top are essentially propositional, but it also makes sense to make similar statements in more expressive languages, like languages that allow to express the effects of actions. Right? So, we can say that if it is a hazardous situation, then usually it is... Uh, it is a case that after switching, after performing the action of switching the pile off, it's not hazardous anymore. Or we may want to express uh, uh, similar statements in logics that allow for the expression of knowledge or obligations or even taxonomies. So, uh, if we look at 
all these statements here, they have the form of an argument. So we have premise, then some conclusion. Or in this case, we have if premises, then usually some conclusion. So the central notion here is a notion of what is expected or what is typical, what is normal, right? So depending on how we look at it, uh, we may use different terms, but roughly the central idea is the idea of normality. And there have been many approaches in the literature to deal with notions of normality, not only in the feasible reasoning, but also in conditional logics, right? We may want to write conditional statements, and the idea is that we select some worlds, we talk about the normal worlds, or in Boutillier's approach uh, in his conditional logic of normality, or even in the, um, in the feasible consequence relations that were studied by Krauss, Lehman, and Magidor, and others. So the, the common point here, roughly, is the following. If we look at all these statements, what they are saying, the intuition behind them, is that uh, we look at the most normal alpha worlds and we require them to be beta worlds. So the, in some sense, the focus is on the premise, right? We have argument forms, which may be defeasible, and we look at, whether the, we look at the cases in which the premise, uh, the, the worlds in which the premise holds and that are more normal. But our contention here is that this is not enough. There are other aspects of defeasibility that we may want to formalize as well, in which the defeasibility is not in the argument, but it is in other operators as well. So here, just to give some uh, examples, we may want to talk about defeasibility of the execution of an action. So for example, you may want to say that if uh, that a normal execution of the action of toggling the switch will turn the light on, right? Or we may want to talk about the feasibility of the knowledge operator. So, for example, we sort of know that the speed of light is the fastest, but this does not prevent us from uh, conceiving a possible situation in a remote area of the universe in which this is not the case, right? Or we can, we can have similar notions in, uh, when talking about obligations and also in taxonomical knowledge as well. So clearly there is a need to formalize these notions and importantly in a general and simple way. So since we are talking about um, different uh, notions involving actions and knowledge and so on, we are going to use to base our framework in, on model logic. So I'll give a very brief recap on it. And then I'm going to present our versions of the feasible uh, modalities. Right, give the semantics and define entailment and show the Tableau method and conclude with a discussion and some comments. Right, so a very quick uh, slide just to set the notation here. So we assume basic model logic K with the two, uh, a multi modal logic K with the operator for necessity and one for possibility. We have the Kripke models with possible worlds, accessibility relations and valuations an example of a Kripke model here. So depending on the application, the, the, the accessibility relation may represent executions of actions or uh, uh, epistemic possibility, right? So here we look at the general case. We say that necessary alpha is true if alpha is true in all the accessible worlds, possible alpha is true if, it holds, if alpha holds in some accessible worlds, and the Boolean formulas are evaluated as usual, right? We say that alpha is true in a model if it is true everywhere, it is valid in a class of models if it is true in every model, and we consider local entailment. Uh, alpha entails beta if every alpha world is a beta world. And of course, we, have, we may have many properties like the duality and the axiom K and other properties depending on the specific application. Here we are going to consider the basic model logic K, which we intend to be the, the, the basic building block on which to explore further extensions. Now, let's have a look at uh, what we can get if we move beyond the defeasible argument forms, right? So what we propose here is to extend modal logic K with two new modalities. One that we call flag, which is intended to be the defeasible version of box, right? And the flame, right? Which, as we are going to see, is the dual of flag. So we extend the language with these uh, uh, sentences as well. The intuition is the following. We say that a formula of the type flag alpha holds if 
alpha holds in the most normal successors of the current world. So we call this notion normal necessity, right? Because we, we only look at the, the best of the accessible worlds. And as I briefly mentioned, flame is the dual of flag. In that sense, it is stronger than the diamond modality. And that's why we call it distinct possibility, in the sense that uh, it is meant to represent situations that are kind of more than possible. So the idea is, as expected, that uh, flame alpha holds in a given world if some of the most normal accessible worlds are alpha, right? So to give some examples here before we talk about the semantics. So in our nuclear power plant example, if we look at this sentence here, it says that a normal execution of the action of switching the pile on results in a situation in which the pile is indeed on, right? So the action may fail, but the normal outcome is that the pile uh, is switched on. Or we may say, for example, that agent A normally knows that if a situation, uh, if the cooler is off, then it is hazardous, right? Because normally the pile is on, right? And we have other examples involving actions and knowledge operators as well. I'll give more examples just after I present the semantics. But before I give the semantics, so uh, which semantics should we use? Or rather, um, how, does it, how does this idea compare to existing frameworks in the literature? So the, the, the obvious candidate to, to use to formalize this notion of defeasible modalities is conditional logics because it shares some of the the, the intuitions that we have. We want to select some of the accessible worlds. So if we look at the original formulation by Stonecker, we have, by Stonecker, we have a selection function which picks out the closest world to a given one. Here, of course, the limitation is that in this framework, there is a uniqueness assumption in the sense that there is always one world that is the selected. We want something that is more general than that, right? So, for example, in the action context, we may have more than two accessible worlds that, we, that are incomparable, so we want to allow for, for both of them. So, in this case, in this sense, we need something different. If we look at Lewis systems of conditional logic, in this case, we don't have a uniqueness assumption, but in some of the systems that he proposed um, in the conditional logic case, right, um, the following version of modus ponens is required, which says that if alpha is true everywhere and alpha arrow beta is the case, then beta is the case everywhere. And if we read this in default reasoning, it doesn't really make sense. So if alpha is true everywhere and the best alphas are betas, doesn't mean that beta is true everywhere. So, but even if we don't, even if we don't use this, um, if we don't require this rule of inference here, the problem remains that for each possible world, there, the, 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 each possible world has a preference relation associated with it, which gives the, those that are the, the selected accessible worlds. So we want something that is simpler than this. We can also think in terms of Boutillier's approach of conditional logics of normality. So in any case here, the modalities still remain classical. So if you want to define divisible versions of modalities, we have to modify the, the, the classical modalities in any way. But the main issue is that there is a conflation between what is local and what is global when it comes to conditional statements, right? So in Boutillier's approach, a conditional is quite different from the, 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 the standard conditional logic approach. And in, in Boutillier's case, a conditional statement is true in a given world if and only if it is true everywhere, which is fine for uh, defeasible statements, but we don't want our defeasible modalities to have a similar behavior. So the, the closest, so the, the approach that looks the more promising here, and, and as we are going to see, we, what we do is quite similar, is the approach by Baltak and Smets, and they propose epistemic plausibility models, which are basically Kripke models uh, in the, the epistemic case, extended with a preference or plausibility relation, right? And they define several modalities based on the, on the, on the preference here. So, so what we are going to do is, is very similar to, to what they have done. I will show the differences towards the end of the talk. Um, for now, I just want to point out that 
The, the basic framework they provided is in the epistemic and doxastic context. So here we, what we want to do is we also want to be able to represent actions, obligations, and allow for, we, we want to have a framework that allows us to integrate with uh, ontologies in description logics. So basically what we want here is a framework, as I said in the beginning, that is general and still elegant and simple. And very important, we don't want to move away from argument forms. We still want to be able to represent uh, defeasible argument forms with appropriate uh, properties. So this is why here we use the approach which was proposed by Krauss, Lehman, and Magidor, the so-called KLM approach. So this approach has been quite successful in the propositional case in the beginning of the 90s, mostly for the following reasons. It provides a very general characterization of the defeasible consequence relation, right, by means of properties that we expect this consequence relation or conditional to hold, to satisfy. And it also serves as the basis for the important notion of rational closure. And recently, there have been extensions of this approach to modal logic and to description logics, right? So this is why we want to, to base our semantics on their constructions. So very briefly, I'll give you a very brief summary of their semantics in the propositional case. So the idea is that they refine the, the preferential semantics proposed by Shoham in the late 80s, and they define preferential models, which are basically partially ordered structures with a set of states, a labeling function, mapping states into valuations, and a preference relation, which is a an irreflexive and transitive relation, so kind of a well-founded order, right, on the set of states. So here is an example of a preferential model in the propositional case. The idea, the intuition is that the worlds that are lower down in the order are more preferred than those that are higher up. And what is important here is how they give a semantics to defeasible statements like this. So they, as expected, uh, a preferential model satisfies a conditional of this form, right? Alpha usually implies beta if and only if the minimal alpha states are beta states. So in our example, we have that situations in which the pile is on are usually non-hazardous, and situations in which the pile is on and the cooler is off are usually hazardous. So what we do here, we modify the, we make a very simple modification of their approach in the model case. We, we propose here very simple modification of Kripke models, which we call preferential Kripke models. They are enriched, they are, mo mo they are Kripke models enriched with a preference relation on the set of possible worlds, right? With the same uh, condition that the preference relation is a kind of a well-founded order, right? So here's an example of a preferential Kripke model. We have our possible worlds. The solid arrows represent the accessibility relations. Here we have only one. And the dashed arrows represent the, the preference relation on the worlds. And again, the worlds that are lower down are more preferred or more normal, more typical, if you want. Then, okay, so then we provide the semantics for our uh, extension of modology K. So all the modal sentences are interpreted as before, no surprise. Then, how do we interpret the flag formula? So flag I alpha is true in all those, in all, in all those worlds such that the minimal worlds that are accessible from it are all alpha worlds, right? And similarly for the flame uh, version, at least one of the minimal worlds that are accessible should be alpha worlds. Then the notions of truth validity are as expected. And we have a little result here just showing that all the modal validities and the rules of inference are preserved with this semantics. So this is a very easy result. Now, to give you an example, so I, I have the truth conditions at the top here. So let's come back to our uh, power plant example and assume that we are reasoning about the actions that the agent can perform or actions that can happen in, the, in, the, in that particular scenario. So we have as propositions, the, the pile is on, the cooler is on, and it's a hazardous situation. And we have actions or events, like the action of switching the pile on, and the occurrence of a malfunction in the, in the power plant. So here is a preferential Kripke model um, uh, with the transitions 
of, of the actions and the preference relation here, right? So for example, worlds in which the pile is on and the cooler is on and it's not hazardous are more normal than situations in which the pile is off and the cooler is on and so on, right? So this is the intuition. So and then here we have some formulas that hold in specific worlds. So for example, uh, in world W1, it turns out that it's impossible to, for a malfunction to happen, right? It's usually impossible. Uh, what is interesting here is that this formula here is true in the whole model, right? So if the pile is off, then the normal effect of switching the pile on is that the pile is on. N uh, notice that the classical version doesn't hold due to world W3, in which there is an execution of the switch action, which leads to a state, to a world in which the pile is not on, right? So, um, and also we have this sentence here, which says that if the cooler is on, then the normal effect of switching the pile on is that we get to a non-hazardous situation. In other words, switching the pile on does not interfere with the status of the cooler, right? Okay, so yes. So just to mention a few validities here. So we have, as I alluded to before, we have duality between flag and flame. We have a couple of equivalences. We have a version of axiom K. Um, here we have a property saying that flag is weaker than box, right? So in a sense, it's a version of supraclassicality as it is usually referred to in the feasible reasoning, right? We have a version of the rule of necessitation and other rules as well. Right. Okay. Uh, now, of course, from the point of view of knowledge representation and reasoning, it becomes important to address the question of what it means for a sentence to be entailed by a knowledge base, right? So we want to perform reasoning. We want to draw conclusions. So uh, knowledge bases are just arbitrary sets of flag formulas, formulas of this extended language. We say that the preferential model, preferential cryptic model satisfies a knowledge base if it satisfies all the formulas in there. And then we get the, the obvious definition of entailment, which is basically the Tarskian definition of entailment. A knowledge base entails a formula if and only if every model of the knowledge base is a, mo is a model of the formula. And by doing that, not surprisingly, we get um, that the, the consequence operator defined in terms of this entailment relation is a Tarskian consequence operator, right? So there may be other interesting notions of entailment that we haven't explored yet related to minimality, but this is the basic one that we, we have at the moment. And of course, if we want to perform reasoning, so one way of doing it is by defining a uh, tableau method. So here is uh, our tableau rules. Actually, they are much simpler than what the, the picture suggests. So basically, we extended um, the basic tableau system from normal modologic K, multimodologic K. So all the Boolean rules remain the same. The box rule remains the same. We have added two extra rules, one for flag, one for flame, and we have modified the one for diamond. So just let's start with the one for flame here. Basically, what we do, we have a preference relation uh, kept as an, an auxiliary data structure, which, which takes care of uh, specifying which worlds are more preferred than, than the others as, as long as the proof goes. So when we, when we, counted, when we encountered a formula of the type uh, flame alpha, we create a new world and we mark it as a minimal world with respect to that accessibility relation, uh, preference relation, sorry. The rule for flame does what the box does in the classical case, but only that it, it, it propagates the alpha formulas to the worlds that are minimal according to the preference relation. The diamond rule, what it does, okay, when we encounter a diamond formula, we have to create a new world. We don't know whether it is, that world will be considered as minimal or not, so we have to explore both cases. We have a splitting here, in which case, either it is not a minimal world, Sorry, either it is a minimal world, right? The new world is a minimal one, a minimal accessible world, or it is not. So we explore both cases, and that is it. So a very simple tableau method. And the result, as expected, is that our tableau calculus for our defeasible modalities is sound and complete with respect to the model preferential semantics that I presented in the previous slides. Okay, so just some discussion. 
Um, OK, so just to come back to the approach by Baltag and Smits. So they, in their context, they define a notion of safe belief, right? They have an operator for safe belief. And the idea is that alpha is a safe belief in a given world if and only if um, alpha holds in all the worlds that are better than the, the current one, right? So basically, a safe belief in their approach means that you have that belief in all the worlds that are better than the current one. And the difference with respect to our flag formulas is that in our case, alpha is, if we interpret flag as a knowledge operator, right, then flag alpha says that alpha is believed in the most prefer, preferred worlds. So these two notions are slightly different. They are, uh, the consequences, the philosophical consequence of choosing either one or the other still remain to be assessed. Our conjecture at the moment is that they are rather complementary not antagonistic, but this still remains to be uh, investigated. Now, uh, before concluding, just some comments about the links between our flag logic and conditional logics. So if we look at conditional logics, standard conditional logics, or maybe some of the, the systems proposed by Lewis, and we define a very specific uh, selection function, which picks out the minimal accessible worlds, minimal according to some preference relation, then our flag formula just becomes a conditional like this. So flag alpha is top arrow alpha. And we can do the other way around as well. For that, we, we need extra accessibility relations and extra modalities. So for example, if for every formula of our language, we define an accessibility relation in such a way that we put there all the pairs composed of worlds satisfying that formula, right? So every time W and W prime satisfy alpha, we relate them together. By doing this, we can define uh, a modality, a flag modality for that accessibility relation, and then the conditional alpha arrow beta becomes flag alpha beta, right? Okay, so to conclude, what we have done, so we have moved beyond the feasible argument forms by also investigating other aspects of defeasibility, namely those that appear in notions such as actions, knowledge, obligations, and so on. And with that, we have moved beyond the original propositional approach by, by the KLM. As I said, here we have investigated the very basic case with model logic K, but we believe that with that, we have a core formalism for further extensions, right? We have defined a tableau, very simple tableau method for the feasible modalities, and our results also transfer to other similarly structured logics, such as, such as description logics and maybe other fragments of first order logic as well. We have many things to do, but just to mention a few of them. So as you may have noticed, we have only one preference relation at the moment, so we can generalize that to a multi-preference case, right? If we want to model uh, different preferences of different agents, so we may need more than one, we will need more than one preference relation. We may all, we also want to look at further restrictions on the semantics, how to uh, tighten the, 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 the semantics. And also, as I mentioned before, if we want to look at uh, specific applications, then we have to look at how these uh, notions, what, what other properties these notions will entail in, a, in specific model systems. So we still have to look in detail in the, in the, to the epistemic, on the epistemic case, the ontic case, and so on. So here, just a few references in which we have been dealing with, this, with problems related to this one. And thank you very much for your attention. So I'm wondering how your work compares to the possibility structures of uh, Hal Bell and Friedman, because uh, they have shown that uh, their framework generalizes uh, all the all the, the all the frameworks you have presented here, and, uh, and they also have two operators which can be interpreted the same way uh, as your operators. So, um, as you what? Am I? As your operators. Okay. So, do you have? Do you know about it? Or uh, maybe I don't know enough to give you a satisfactory answer, but I, I've seen that uh, their approach captures the KLM approach. It's actually more general. 
Uh, but I, I, I don't know how the, the feasible modalities would be defined in that case. I'm not really sure. I, I should have a look in more detail to, to, to see whether it is the case. Yeah, because it seems to me that uh, their framework can embed your framework because it's uh, very general. Is it? It starts with very, very basic, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe it's better to... Uh, I'll definitely have a look. So you, you, you think that they can um, model this idea of the feasible modalities of what is uh, uh, the normal accessible world? So is, is that more or less? Yes. Okay, yes. That's, okay that's interesting. Uh, okay, I, I should have a closer look then. So you talked about this uh, extensions of modal systems, so, but I'm wondering the other way around. So in this uh, KLM paper, they talk about this preferential set semantics. They basically start with this, if I remember correctly, the cumulative systems and then preferential systems. And then Lehman and Magidor went into to the rational system, kind of adding negative rationality or some kind of rationality postulates and this semantics. So I was wondering whether they would correspond to sort of more interesting uh, properties of these modalities that yes. you introduced? Yes, so at the moment we look at the preferential case, so um, the modalities are defeasible but we get a logic that's still monotonic, right? The entailment is monotonic and we, we do not look at ranked models and we do not assume uh, rational monotonicity but of course a next interesting step will be to, to look at the uh, ranked models and that tighten the class of preferential models and especially because we can define we can state uh, the proper the KLM properties using our diffusible modalities I didn't show here but we can state them and we can state a version of rational monotonicity using our approach so it would be interesting to see what the, the implications are and that's still uh, on the go yeah. thank you